And thanks for joining us. I'm Richard Lester. I'm a professor of nuclear science and engineering and associate provost for international activities. And it's a real privilege to introduce this session. This is the fifth in the series of six climate action symposia that began last fall. The topic of today's session is the role of research universities and MIT's own climate initiatives. It's the first one that's wholly online. I'm told that more than 1,700 people are attending. This significantly exceeds registration at the previous symposia, and it's another indication that we've learned to do some things at MIT during COVID that we didn't imagine were possible beforehand. It's a sort of silver lining at a dark time. And worth noting, because in a small way, the response to COVID at MIT has demonstrated those attributes, ingenuity and ability are we go, are we rolling? to improvise. Okay, thanks. And an ability to plan and mobilize that will be critical to our ability to survive the even greater challenges of climate change. And that's the question for today's symposium. How can research universities and MIT specifically augment society's reserves of those same attributes, ingenuity, improvisation, and the will to act that are needed for the climate emergency? I think most of us agree that the time for business as usual is past. The stakes are too high. But we also need to think clearly about what our institution is capable of, both its strengths and the limits of what it can do. Our speakers today are going to discuss this question, and in a moment, I'll introduce the symposium chairs, Professor Hammond and Dr. Newman. But first, to help frame the discussion, let me suggest three possible answers in order of increasing difficulty. One key role for research universities is to propose new ways to understand the problem. At any given moment, the climate debate is dominated by orthodoxies, and sometimes these are the biggest obstacles to action. Denialism is one such orthodoxy, of course, but others are much closer to what many of us at this session may believe. A key role of research universities is to challenge these orthodoxies and develop new ways to think about what must be done, drawing on new science and the discovery of new facts. It's a difficult role, but universities are well qualified to play it, in part because we don't have to speak with one voice. A second and even more challenging role is to tackle climate-related problems for which solutions don't currently exist. Hard problems whose solution would have game-changing consequences and where progress depends on cutting edge technologies and advances in forefront knowledge in the physical or life or social sciences. Some will object that, we've already, that we already have all of the technologies and innovations that we need, or that efforts to develop new ones will distract from the more important objective of adopting the correct policies and regulations, or that swinging for the fences on new solutions will just take too long. But we are far from having everything we need to reduce climate risks to acceptable levels and in ways that are fair, equitable, and affordable. There are still many unsolved problems and there is no conflict between focusing on what we don't have and implementing what we already know how to do. The third role for universities is the most challenging of all. It's to help build a new research and innovation system for the climate emergency, a new system for rapidly delivering climate-related social and technological innovations to augment the system that exists today. Why is this necessary? Because our existing government-led innovation system is falling short even relative to the inadequate benchmark set by governments themselves, the Mission Innovation Pledge, many of them made at the Paris Climate Conference, were falling behind. And so there's a role for research universities working with philanthropy, with industry, and with affected communities to create robust new pathways for climate-related innovation and problem solving. 
Obviously, private investment isn't the substitute for public action. Governments must eventually step up, but we cannot afford to wait and our efforts can complement and perhaps accelerate government efforts. And this is why at MIT, even before the pandemic is over, we're scaling up our efforts in climate. You're going to hear about several of these activities from our speakers, but here I'd just like to mention one because I think it speaks to all three of the roles that I've mentioned. This is a whole of MIT effort that we're calling Climate Grand Challenges. It rests on two pillars. First, basic and applied research on some of the toughest, highest impact problems, grand challenge problems in climate mitigation, adaptation and remediation. Second, strategies for compressing the time needed for field testing, implementation and scaling of the resulting solutions in both developed and developing economies with a focus on human behavior and social engagement and with feedback to research and design. We launched this new initiative in July and the response from researchers from all five MIT schools and the college has already been extraordinary with almost 100 letters of interest from over 300 faculty and senior researchers covering the whole landscape of climate related research at MIT, including humanities and the social sciences, and many of them describing potentially transformative projects that are broad in scope and large in ambition. I think you'll hear more details about this later, but again, thank you for joining us for this fifth climate symposium and welcome. And now let me hand over to our co-chairs, two key leaders at MIT, Professor Paula Hammond and Dr. Julie Newman. Paula. Thank you so much, Richard. I'm really excited to launch our fifth climate symposium. In a research university, we have a unique opportunity to bring scholars together to think, to learn and to create new structures and approaches. We can address complex global challenges such as climate change because we have the ability to cross disciplines and engage in open discourse about new solutions. Because universities can launch new ideas at relatively low risk and push the boundaries, they are excellent places for enabling technologies. Yet, they are also places where the top minds think about policy, economics, ethics, and the social impact of climate change in different communities. Openness of the academic enterprise and the ability to engage the talent of our students in concert with the expertise embedded across our schools and departments makes MIT an especially rich place for addressing this particular problem. We can learn a great deal from the partnership of all of our disciplines to provide insights into how and why we must address this critical world challenge. Higher education also has a responsibility and opportunity to set their sights on being an exemplar organization and community and how to face, respond to, and address the climate change issue. Today's panel will outline how MIT is amplifying our efforts to advance the global efforts informed by science, including the social sciences that inform us on the impact of climate change on our people and society, and the physical sciences that provide us with technological understanding. My co-organizer, Julie Newman, the Institute's first director of sustainability, We'll take it here, from here to describe a little bit about the second panel. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you all for joining us today. So as you've heard from Richard and Paula, institutions of higher education have been called upon and are well positioned to respond to these grand challenges outlined by both of my colleagues. Today, MIT is well positioned to contribute significant ideas, policies, technologies and campus-based models that can help us to redefine and protect our future. In the second panel, you will learn about how MIT has positioned itself to look internally to transform our own practices by transparently grappling with these grand challenges outlined earlier at the local level and become a testbed and exemplar for others. So in so doing, we provide a platform for building organizational and community-based solutions. So I look forward to that discussion. Back to you, Paula.